calls, yeah? Yeah. 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 So whatever you're set. Gary? It will help to speak at Gary. Okay, yeah. yeah. And then Gary, um, in the background, we see uh, a, a garage, the garage of the uh, Scientology Hotel Fort Harrison, the mecca of Scientology and of the organization. Of course. Um, you have a history with this kind of place here. Um, what happened in that garage with you and, and the other people? And that's in that garage in the background. The third floor is where, during the time that I was there, uh, that's where the RPF slept. On the second floor is where we ate. And what is the RPF? Oh, that's it's the Rehabilitation Project Force. That's Scientology's punishment camp. It's a labor force. Uh, Scientologists, uh, Sea Org members of Scientology are assigned there f as punishment. It could be for any infraction. It could be for a rock slam on, the, on their e-meter. Uh, virtually anything. It's completely arbitrary. And they're assigned for an arbitrary amount of time. It's until they have gone through what they consider the program necessary to, in their terms, rehabilitate them. It's to recondition them. It's to break their will. And when it's deemed that they are sufficiently broken and sufficiently reconditioned, they, they can get out of the RPF. I was there for 17 months. In I a was parking lot? Well... Staying in a parking lot and sleeping in a parking lot. I wasn't in the parking lot the whole time because we did uh, the cleaning of the building, we did renovations while we were here, we went through an auditing program, a lot of uh, security checking. Security checking is uh, metered interrogations. Uh, metered, by which I mean using the e-meter. People are asked about their crimes. Their, everything about their life is, is delved into. And people had to confess to all of these crimes in order to go through the program to get out. But I was assigned July 1st, 1976 by L. Ron Hubbard personally. And at that time there was only my, me and my then wife, Terry, in the RPF. So I was the founding father of the Clearwater RPF. The first prisoner. I was the first prisoner. The first prisoner. Which and people really are prisoners. Sci Scientology will say that people go voluntary. Absolutely not. To me it was completely, I was so devastated I couldn't eat for the first 36 hours. It was as if my whole life had been stripped from me because I knew, having been on the ship with Hubbard, I knew what the RPF meant. What does it mean? It, it is prison. And a person in the RPF cannot speak unless spoken to by, by a non-RPF member. He must address everyone as sir. If he does not address someone as sir, that, that is such a big offense that he's assigned what is called a big lap. A big lap is when someone runs from the bottom basement of the Fort Harrison up to the 10th floor, up all the steps and back down. A long lap was assigned, someone had to run all the way up and down the garage, the long way, all the way from the top, all the way to the bottom, and all the way back again. And that could be as well for any infraction. RPF members had to run wherever they went, between, between jobs. And did you have a special um, outfit? We, we had to wear black boiler suits. And with a special pants also? After you had been in a certain amount of time and had gone through the processing sufficiently, you obtained a white armband. After another certain amount of time and going through more conditioning, you got a gold armband. And you got a white armband, you got a gold armband, and then you got out. During most of those 17 months, I was the RPF bosun, who was the person in charge of the RPF. So I was responsible for the administration of punishment of all of the other people who got assigned. When I finally got out of the RPF, there were, uh, I would say, 80 people. And subsequently, I knew it grew to 120, 150 people. That was just here in Clearwater. There were other RPFs. There was an RPF on the ship. It was started by Hubbard in 1974. 
uh, on the Apollo. It was the first RPF, the first prison camp. On right. The ship. And other Apollos. Right. And then that one was disbanded when the ship crew came ashore in the fall of 1975. But then it was reinstituted here with the assignment of myself and, and my wife Terry. Uh, Any other remembrance what happened in that hotel with you? Or, or was Hubbard inside, slept there? or Hubbard was never to. I think he visited maybe once, very, very secretively. But. Uh, when when we came ashore, uh, we lived first of all in Daytona Beach. That means you came from the ship, which okay. had been in Europe, going cruising in the Mediterranean. Where? First, and then Hubbard sold we were, the ship. We were on the west on the west coast of of Europe, in Portugal and Spain, and then and the little Atlantic islands, the Canaries and and Madeira, and then the end of 1974, we came. Uh, across the Atlantic and we were in the Caribbean for the next year and it was from Curaçao in the Netherlands Antilles that most of the crew came came uh, here to Florida but the what else do you want to know oh, well, we go on like that, yeah. <laughs> so how was the, um, the living condition inside this garage to sleep did you sleep there were the cars parked and you had a, a bed or how, how can I imagine that? There were no cars parked in the area that, that we inhabited. Mm -hmm. So those were, we, we stored our, our little beds, their fold up cots, those, those who had them, some of them slept on a mattress on the floor. That means the second floor was only for the RPF people sleeping in the living area? No, the second floor of the garage, there was a part of it where we had the tables where everyone ate. The RPF ate after the rest of the crew and they ate whatever was left. That was the rule for for the people in the RPF. That had been the rule from back on the ship and it continued to be the rule as long as I was in the RPF. Uh, th all these people were considered under guard. So we had guards posted when people were asleep there was always a guard posted. There were other circumstances in which people were considered more of a security risk, and they were then given their individual guards and kept guarded individually 24 hours a day. In, in that garage? In, in the garage or in rooms in, in the Fort Harrison. Some people were, were guarded uh, and kept down in the basement. And these were people that I knew who were sometimes under my command when I ran the RPF. No one is there voluntarily. Everyone is there as punishment. And how was the day in, in the RPF here on that Fort Harrison? Um, you wake up or somebody wakes you up or and is there a roll call, something like that, that anybody is there? And how does it work? How is the work day as an RPF inmate? Here? It, is, it is broken down into very precise segments. And it, you are supposed to get seven hours sleep from lights out to lights on and there's wake up you're given half an hour to get your things together hygiene time they call it and then muster muster is the gathering of of every everyone we gathered into uh, what were called sections so on top of the rpf was the bosun underneath the bosun was the master at arms the maa he was the person responsible for uh, the, what they call ethics it's actually the, the system of punishment uh, similar all throughout Scientology but far more severe in the RPF so we would meet oh, and underneath the the mastered arms then we had section heads and all then the RPF is divided up into RPF members RPF sections RPF section heads MAA and the um, and the bosun So in a muster, the, the MAA or the bosun would conduct the muster. We were given uh, daily orders. The communications were, were handed out as necessary. And it always ended with, with a shout that went, Commodore, Founder, Source. 
In the RPF? In the RPF. All of them together, you could hear it go throughout, throughout the building and throughout... In the garage? Yeah, and throughout Clearwater. No one was allowed to leave, and if anyone did escape, we took the, we had the, the surroundings in Clearwater divided up into a grid, and RPF inmates, RPF members, people who were deemed not security risks, were then assigned to a particular place on the grid to go back to retrieve the person. Euphemistically, we called it the Bosun's Running Club. So if someone took off, we would go out and, and attempt to get them back. That means if somebody runs out of that garage, running out of the street, going this direction or this direction... You get them. You have to get them. You have to run after him. Right. And how many people running after him? Only the boss and the boss of the RPF? The a, a, number, a number of RPF members. Generally, people did not run away like that because they knew the, the place was surrounded with security guards and Scientologists, so you like didn't do that. But like they would get away. Security guards, they are also secure the place here and looking that no RPF people are going outside here. Right, uh, anyone that should not be leaving doesn't leave. Anyone who they think shouldn't get in doesn't get in. Very security conscious. But generally the escapees were those who were able to slip away, assigned to do something somewhere, and while they were doing that, they're gone. Okay, thank you. For You're welcome. <laughs>
keep on the legal side of things. There's a load of them in there too. This guy's making her go right to. Sure as hell wouldn't want anybody to think, would we? Peter's the back there again. He's back there behind him. Yeah. Are there people in that? Let me see if there's any in that bus. I think it's empty. Yeah, it's empty. They're all coming in the back, you're right.
um, you have um, lived together with uh, Everyone Hubbard on his ship uh, Apollo. Yes. What do you know about the um, starting of the uh, rehabilitation project uh, prison camp uh, force um, starting on the ship and then developing? What do you know about that? When did it start and what happened on the ship? Uh, it's, it started uh, the beginning of 1974, started by Hubbard, and initially people were assigned uh, who were um, RSers, that means a rock slam, it's a particular needle movement on the E-meter, people who had low OCAs, that is the personality test, that uh, they lure people into Scientology with, if you had a low score on that and you were a non-producer or low producer or, a, or your stats were low, you could be assigned to the RPF. And uh, people assigned at that time wore black boiler suits, they were isolated from the rest of the crew and, and they stayed in one of the holds of the ship, one of the forward holds. And uh, they lived down there, they audited each other down there, they sec-checked each other and uh, went through the, virtually the same uh, RPF program which then got reinstituted uh, when the crew moved ashore uh, in Florida. And for how long you have been on the ship together with Hubbard? I came on board in uh, the beginning of 71 and left in the fall of 75 and throughout virtually that whole period except for uh, some months, pr probably 10 months, in 1973, and a few other times during that period, Hubbard was on board and ran the whole operation. Mm -hmm. And when he started with the RPF uh, program, Hubbard? Yes. When did he start? Oh, the beginning of uh, 1974. And what was Now the that was. To oh, well, the reason is. Uh, to further his control and domination of uh, Scientologists and Sea Org members. Scientology exerts incredible control over its people, right? From the beginning, as soon as you enter the door of Scientology, they seek to control more and more and more of your life. And the RPF is like the ultimate control because you are completely dominated by the organization and by the RPF rules. They're incredibly restrictive. You had no, no newspapers, no magazines, no radio, really no contact. You were not allowed to speak to anyone else unless spoken to. You ate after the rest of the crew and you ate whatever was left after the rest of the crew was fed. You had to run everywhere, including running on, the, on this ship. And running from where to where around the ship? Around the ship. For how long? It w you ran, the rule was you ran everywhere. So if you were going to eat, you ran. If you were coming from eating, you ran. If you were going to the bathroom, you ran. That, that was the rule. And this starts, everything starts on the ship? Yes. And where and did Hubbard personally uh, wrote down this um, this RPF program? Did he invent it? Uh, yeah, it's his invention. He uh, instructed Ken Urquhart, who was his personal communicator, and he approved the uh, the program which was written on his instructions by Ken Urquhart. So you'll see Ken Urquhart's signature or byline on it, but it is completely the work and all the rules and restrictions are all L. Ron Hubbard's. Mm -hmm. And where did you, uh, or did uh, uh, an RPF inmate slept on the ship? Was it a special well, yeah, area? Yeah, they, they slept uh, all together in one of the holds on the ship. It was a cargo hold. Cargo hold. There was no daylight? Right. Nothing? Right. And the machine always working? Well, it, it, was, uh, it was not a pleasant place because you had a lot of hot bodies sweating in a very closed space with completely inadequate ventilation. It was very unpleasant. Now they had something worse than the RPF and that was the RPF's RPF. So if someone 
was considered a security risk within the RPF, or even if someone exhibited some joy at being assigned to the RPF, they were assigned to the RPF's RPF. They could not even speak to an RPF member. They got no study. They got less sleep. They were kept under guard the whole time, and these people were, had, to, had to clean the bilges on board the ship. And when did he start with the RPF? RPF uh, introduced? The RPF's RPF was introduced shortly after the RPF began, and it was introduced because someone appeared to be happy about being assigned to the RPF. So um, he invented something uh, much harder. Yes. And, uh, and how many people uh, uh, went through the RPF on the ship during that period of, I think, two years? Yeah, well, it was really, it existed for, I would say, the, a year or something more than a year on the ship. However, before everyone came ashore, the ship's RPF was, was really terminated. And when we came ashore in Daytona, and when they first set up the base in Florida, there was no RPF. So it was something over a year that it went on on, on board the ship. And uh, how was the route, uh, or the, um, yeah, where was the ship cruising? Uh, during that period of time, when it began, I believe we were in Portugal. In Portugal. Right. And we were during that period of time in Portugal, Spain, and uh, the Canaries, and Madeira. Mm -hmm. And who chose which country uh, to, to go in or to...? Well, we were very limited in the countries that we could go to uh, because of exposure. Uh, we pretended during that period of time to be a company called Operation and Transport Corporation of Panama. No one knew on the outside that we were a Scientology operation and that Hubbard, the Commodore, the total boss of Scientology, was running what was going on on board. So all of this was kept secret from the people in the ports that we visited. But we were limited in, in those ports. We had, we had trouble in Spain and then we had trouble in Portugal. And finally, there was what we called the Rock Festival. And the local people stoned the ship through the, uh, the motorcycles of the crew into the harbor, threw one of the, uh, pushed one of the, the vehicles into the harbor, and uh, uh, let, let loose the lines. And the ship ultimately went out to anchor. And shortly after that, made the trip across the Atlantic and uh, uh, to the Caribbean, landed in, in Bermuda, stayed in Bermuda and went, went on to the Bahamas and then to Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad and the Netherlands Antilles. And so we, we uh, sailed around the Caribbean for the next year. Mm -hmm. That means four years you sailed uh, through the Mediterranean Sea between 1971 and 19. 74, 75? There, n not in the Mediterranean, but we were on the, the west coast of, of Europe. Port west. west coast, Spain and, Spain and Portugal. Oh, never in the Mediterranean? Not during my time. It had been previously. It had been in, in Corfu and Spain and uh, I think a, an Italian port. Um, but, but that was before I came on board. And when you came on board? I came on board in Morocco. In Morocco? Yeah. So we... We traveled up and down the coast of Morocco during my first year on board. When was it? Uh, the beginning of 71. Mm -hmm. So uh, ten, Tangiers, Casablanca, Safi, and Agadir were our four uh, Moroccan ports. And then we, we spent time in Funchal and Madeira and uh, the Canaries and then uh, the mainland at uh, Lisbon and Setubal, and then the uh, some Spanish ports. And uh, how many people lived on that boat? It Four. averaged, while I was on board, around 400. 400. Mm -hmm. And who was chosen to go on the ship? And what was the, what did you do on the ship? 
what was the reason only cruising you have to do something or not well all of Scientology was managed from on board the ship the whole world, the whole England every org every org worldwide yeah, was all organized from the ship right managed managed by the ship right or from the ship right and we continually sent out missions from the ship to go to orgs around the world so it means somebody from from the ship uh, traveled by land by train or by, by plane right to London to Germany to Frankfurt or Vienna or other places exactly to give messages from Hubbard to that to that part well more than messages to actually perform some function in many cases to take over an organization to replace uh, staff who were there um, sometimes we call them garrison missions so someone would go and stay for a long period of time. Sometimes they were observation missions. They would just go look, find out what was going on, and report back. But often they were ethics missions. So go and remove the executive director of an organization, replace them with someone else, put people in ethics conditions. And the more likely um, was it mostly intelligence objects, objections, something. There, there were intelligence um, objectives. Uh, we had an intelligence unit on the ship uh, throughout 1974, um, 74 and into 75. I was the intelligence officer on the ship. So I was the intelligence officer on board when we were in the Caribbean. And what was your job as an, as an intelligence officer? To gather information about uh, enemies perceived threats in the local environment to predict attacks, to counter attacks, to um, uh, take care of security matters. Ta so I was involved in both the internal security, that is security threats among, among the crew, and then external security, that is gathering information about the police, about the government, about customs, those sorts of journalists also absolutely something. yeah. But there was no critic scene like today. The people that picketed it on, on, on at the harbor when you arrived, or something like this. No, occasionally someone would find out that we were Scientology, or occasionally there would be uh, bad press written. Uh, we really got kicked out of Europe, and subsequently had trouble in the Caribbean because they thought that we were a CIA operation which made sense because we were all English speaking, a lot of Americans on board. It was clear that we were doing something different from what we were telling them. We really were an intelligence organization. So it was quite reasonable that they would think that we were the CIA. And we had trouble. In fact, the Rock Festival, uh, as I understand it, originated because they thought that we were the CIA. And a lot of these countries at that time were very anti-American. What kind of rock festival was that? Or what was this? We, we call it the rock festival, but it was a lot of uh, a local crowd got together and threw rocks at the ship. Where? In Funchal, in Madeira. Mm -hmm. From where they know that you have been Scientologists? They did not, as I understand it, they did not know that we were Scientology. They thought that we were the CIA. Now subsequently, because that CIA rumor followed us through, also through the Caribbean, uh, Hubbard decided to expose the fact that we were connected to Scientology. So then what we began to say was, we're still Operation and Transport Corporation Limited, but one of our clients is the Church of Scientology. And the Church of Scientology is, of course, opposed to the IRS, the CIA, psychiatrists and governments around the world and are attacked by these governments. So how could we be the CIA if our client is the Church of Scientology? Mm -hmm. But because that really was the beginning of the end of the ship existence, it could no longer continue to operate because its cover was blown. And that's when Hubbard made the decision to bring the whole ship operation ashore and the and missions were sent out from the ship to ultimately to purchase 
uh, what became the Flag Land Base, the Fort Harrison and the Clearwater Bank Building and other properties in the, in the Clearwater area. So the American, many, most of the American crew came directly to Clearwater and they were the people who were involved in the initial setup and they came into Clearwater under cover of another company he called United Churches of Florida. The non-Americans, and I'm a Canadian so I, I ended up as well with the non-Americans, they went for the most part to Daytona Beach and that was the staging area. Hubbard as well was in Daytona Beach and he ran the various missions from Daytona which were purchasing the properties and then ultimately setting them up, getting them clean, getting permits, handling the, the uh, uh, local government and handling the various media attacks because the media and the local authorities began to sense that there's something wrong here and they then blew the cover on that and exposed it as Scientology. Then, of, By then, of course, Scientology already had the properties, they already had the personnel there, so were fairly well entrenched. By December of 1975, uh, Hubbard then moved his personal office, including myself, uh, to a, an apartment complex in uh, Dunedin. King Arthur's Court was the name of it. And uh, we rented a number of those apartments, which were, it was really as intended as a condominium complex, uh, but it, it never was, never had been sold at that time at least. And so we were able to get a lease for, I think it was six months or perhaps longer. And so the personal office of, of LRH, L. Ron Hubbard, was set up there and we called that United Churches Extension. And then uh, that Hubbard was there, that cover as well was blown, so he fled from there sometime early in the morning, 2 or 3 a.m. He took off along with Mike and Kimma Douglas and they drove up the coast uh, to Washington, D.C. And he lived in Washington, D.C. until, I guess, June of 1976 when again I met up with him this time in Culver City, California uh, where I had set up a uh, another staging area. This was in anticipation of the purchase of another base for Hubbard and his personal staff and this was to be in La Quinta, California and they did purchase those properties and Hubbard lived there for a period of time and uh, he and Mary Sue and their personal staffs all arrived at the Culver City property and it was there that uh, I got in a, a rather heated argument with Mary Sue Hubbard's communicator or secretary and uh, Hubbard had me uh, taken out of there and he sent the deputy guardian for intelligence, the DGI US on Take it just the, I think that's Frank. Okay. What was the, is, is this going? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was the reason uh, that Hubbard was uh, always living as a fugitive, like uh, from the beginning of the 70s, going on a ship for four years and hiding on a ship and doing all these kind of uh, things? What was the reason? Well, the, uh, his one, his other organization, the Guardian's Office, was involved in a lot of covert activities, uh, intelligence operations, and dirty tricks. And that is really what has, what chased him his whole life, because those people were being exposed and there were, there was civil litigation going on at that time. There were, uh, there was a war that Scientology had going with the Internal Revenue Service in the US and Hubbard continually feared being served with process and having to appear in court give testimony or being charged with a crime. So 
we were continually on the lookout for process servers. There was a very high awareness of people trying to get, get close to Hubbard and serve them with papers. So that, plus there were very serious incidents. There was a woman who uh, was killed on board, very suspicious circumstances. She ended up with a bullet hole right in her head while Hubbard fled from the ship at that time. And the Guardian's office, you know, instead of having some kind of compassion for, for the, the family and the father broken up over the death of, of his daughter, Hubbard had the Guardian's office at, attack the family. That's the kind of person he was, and that's why he lived in fear all the time, because he and his organization were doing rotten things to people. They were doing abusive things. The RPF itself was incredibly abusive. And in my circumstance, I simply, I really just got in an argument with this woman who was herself being very abusive, and Hubbard had me picked up by the DGI US, Dick Wiegand, who was ultimately one of the 11 people convicted and sent to federal prison for, for crimes. And uh, I was taken by Wiegand to the uh, Intelligence Bureau in, in Los Angeles, which was then in the building, which is now the Celebrity Center. And I was locked up there for two weeks, kept under guard. And then Hubbard ordered me back to Clearwater and ordered me assigned to the RPF. And that was the beginning of the Clearwater RPF. I was, I along with my wife, at the time Terry, we were the first people assigned to the RPF in Clearwater and we were the beginning of a build-up because after us many other people got assigned until 17 months later by the time I left there was 80 people in the RPF and it continued to build from there up well over a hundred. Mm. That means um, the first RPF had been um, introduced on the ship Apollo? Yes. And then the second one was uh, in Fort Harrison, in the garage? Right. In Clearwater? Right. Mm -hmm. And what happened to you at, uh, at this RPF in Clearwater? Well, my first day there, I was uh, immediately put to work cleaning some, some steps in the, um, actually going down into the boiler room in, in what is uh, a, a sort of sub-basement off the basement in the, in the Fort Harrison. So my wife and I cleaned these steps for several hours. And my first day and a half there, it was so traumatic to me. I was so devastated at this. It was as if my whole life had been ripped out from me. I couldn't eat, and I was just extremely devastated, so all I did was, was work. But I began to pull out of that, and then we, she and I, uh, set about obtaining the various policies which had been earlier used um, to set up the, the um, RPF on the ship. We used the same policies to set up the RPF in Clearwater. And as more people got added to the RPF, I became the RPF bosun, and Terry, my wife at the time, uh, became the RPF MAA. The bosun is the person within the RPF who's in charge of it, and his immediate junior is the MAA, or mas Master at Arms, in responsible for ethics. And that means uh, the bosun is also an um, prisoner. Yes. And But he's uh, the chief in prisoner. Right. And then after comes the uh, MAA. Right. And what is the, uh, the job of an MAA? And MAA is the person who uh, is responsible for ethics, punishment, discipline in the RPF. But uh, it is used when? Ethics. And why? Oh, ethics is used to, to control. Ethics is used to discipline. It's used to, to punish. Uh, and we had a, a system of, of ethics for the RPF, which was specific to the RPF, called Rocks and Shoals. And so uh, something as small as not saying sir was, could be punished with 
having someone run a big lap. A big lap was to run all the way from the bottom of the Fort Harrison up to the 10th floor and all the way down. And there were various other conditions which could be applied. Conditions such as treason, enemy, liability, confusion, and the RPF's RPF. What does it mean, these conditions? Each, each condition uh, has a formula which the person must apply in order to move up into the next condition and each condition comes with uh, penalties. So you can get additional time in the RPF. You can do, have to do what they call amends projects. So you will be given, in addition to having to do your regular workload, you could be assigned an extra 25 hours. So you couldn't move out of the lower condition until you'd put in an extra 25 hours of labor. That was a standard assignment of an ethics condition to a person in the RPF. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of the ship's agent. Always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the most. It, it's working? Any peeps sound, huh? Is it working? Okay, good. Okay. Um, so uh, the most important Scientologists are, uh, are have been at the ship Apollo, the 400. Yeah, during, during that period of time. In beginning of the 70s, up to the mid of the 70s, until it was uh, right, introduced and into to, to Clearwater, Florida. Right. And now the, the uh, main Scientologists, the top Scientologists, many of them have, have not been on board. Uh, David Miscavige was never on board the Apollo. We'd gotten rid of the Apollo before David Miscavige came on the scene. Norman Starkey, one of the, the top Scientologists right now, he was the captain on board the ship uh, during a period of time when I was the legal officer on board the ship. We were actually quite close on board the ship. That means is uh, the uh, the now leaders are the second generation leaders, which uh, haven't been on the ship. Right. A lot of the of the present day leaders have not been on the ship. But the Secret Service um, of Scientology, the former uh, GO Guardian Office and now Office of Special Affairs Court, uh, they stayed uh, during Hubbard's time on the ship in England? In well, the Guardian's office had personnel all over the world. They, they, there were Guardian's office personnel in every organization around the world. There was also, uh, on board the ship, there was the office of the controller, because the controller, Mary Sue Hubbard, was over top of the Guardian's office. The Guardian then was Jane Kember. So the, the chain of command went Jane Kember, Mary Sue Hubbard, L. Ron Hubbard. He was over top of the GEO on one side and the SO, the C organization that I was a part of, on the other. And who gave the orders to break in, in the government uh, uh, houses in Washington? Those were all pursuant to Hubbard's orders, which were, which were the... Uh, Part of what was going on was a program called Snow White, and that was originated by Hubbard. In fact, uh, I believe that he wrote that when he was in Queens, New York in 1973. He was in, in Queens in 73 because a, an operation which he had attempted to set up in Morocco uh, blew up and euphemistically there was a, a shore flap it was exposed and the, the people who were there, including Hubbard and his family, were forced to leave Morocco. Hubbard arrived back at the ship, but at that time he was facing a, uh, a charge of fraud in France and he was afraid that he, that he might be extradited back to France. Ultimately he was uh, tried in absentia and I believe convicted 
in France. But he was afraid of that at that time, and that's why he left uh, from, from Lisbon. He left Morocco, came to Lisbon, and then left from Lisbon to New York. And what he wanted to do in, in New York? Well, he was just in hiding. In hiding. Yeah. But there he introduced or he developed the Snow White program to break in government offices right. to get information uh, about Scientology, what they, what they had. Right. And Ultimately, that program led to the break-ins, which then led to the FBI raid in 1977, and that led to the uh, arrest and con charging and conviction of 11 top uh, intelligence personnel, including Mary Sue Hubbard, who went to federal prison for her part in the Snow White program. So why they didn't imprison the also Elron Hubbard for developing the program and giving the orders? It really was because all the intelligence personnel linked together and shielded Hubbard by essentially agreeing and stating that he was not responsible for it. So they took the blame, Mary Sue Hubbard took the blame so that Hubbard would not in fact be indicted. Hubbard was an unindicted co-conspirator. So it was a deal, that means or they wanted to, to hide the boss. Right, they hid the boss. But the boss was the, the right one. It would be the right one. He was the bad guy because he gave the orders. Everything that was done was, was done by these people believing that they were doing what he wanted. And he was informed about the break-ins? Uh, I don't know if, if he knew each specific activity that was going on, but he was kept briefed all the time about Guardian's office activities and what was going on, including with the intelligence personnel. Mm -hmm. uh, one mm -hmm. You want to drink something? Oh, uh, good. She's speeding. Um, so, how many people have been in the Sea Org in the 70s on the ship uh, and in England altogether? 800,000? Oh, yeah, there were probably. Probably a thousand at that time, well, that means around, the, around the world. That means 400 on the ship? Yeah. Four, well, some of the people who were on the ship were not, were not Sea Org. There were people who came to the ship for, to be audited. That is, they, they paid uh, to undergo the Scientology psychological processing. That means the same what they are right now doing at Fort Harrison, for example. Exactly. They've, they've done it before on the ship Apollo. Yep. And even Hubbard gave auditing to other people? or No, but, but Hubbard was uh, involved at times in case supervising and directing the auditors. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of status involved, as there is today at the Fort Harrison, in having flag auditing. And people, he realized people were willing to pay up to a thousand dollars an hour to come to flag the flagship and be audited by one of the supposedly top auditors around the world. Mm -hmm. And there are Scientologists who are very wealthy and they paid a lot of money to do that. And they continue to pay a lot of money to do that at the Fort Harrison. Well, it means at, at that time the Mecca of Scientology was on the ship Apollo. Exactly. And then the new Mecca was from 1975 on in the Fort Harrison right. in Clearwater. Right. This was the same. Your time at the RPF in or at the Fort Harrison. Uh, for how long did you stay there? It was Seventeen months. So during the first couple of days, uh, my wife and I we slept in uh, the laundry room uh, on the I think it's on the second or, or third floor. Um, and then we moved as more people were added. We moved up to the tenth floor, right adjacent to the ballroom. It's like a sort of storage area off to the side. And that's where the RPF set up its birthing. And birthing in those days was just roll down a, a, a mattress. And some of us had the little roll out cots. And that's what we, we slept on. So we put the cots away at night 
and set up a course room. And uh, the, the course room provided the auditor training necessary for everyone to audit with a twin who was assigned to him. And so you co-audited each other and co-sec-checked each other. Sec-checks are the security checks, which I, I mentioned earlier. It's interrogations. Who was your twin? Or who was your twin? My twin was uh, Andre Clavel, another Canadian uh, compatriot of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we twinned together. I guess um, he audited me for six or seven hundred hours, and I audited him for something over a thousand hours to get us through our respective RPF programs. And uh, each, uh, after a, probably a month, then the, the RPF, which had grown to perhaps 20 people by this time, we moved down to the uh, third floor into a storage area, which is just off the auditorium in the Fort Harrison. And it, we were in the summer, at that time, it was extremely hot. It was unventilated, and uh, it was v very rough conditions for for all of us. And then we outgrew that space, and so a number of people still so yep. Okay, so so, with, so within the RPF, um, you audited each other together right. with a twin right. prisoner, yeah? That means two prisoners together, right. sitting together, and how does it go on? What, is, what are they doing? So there's a meter between us, and if I were the sec checker or the auditor, then I would ask you a l from a list, a prepared list of questions. And they are often uh, questions of a, a sexual nature, you know, have, have, you ever, have you ever had a homosexual experience? And I have to answer to you. Right. I'm watching the meter, mm -hmm. and so... It, and an e-meter is like a lie detector. It, that, that's exactly how it's used. So I'm looking if there's some kind of needle movement, mm -hmm. and then I get you to talk about it. And then I zero in on, okay, who was it with, when was it, who knew about it, who should have known about it, and all of the information around that until I've got it all. And then we'll move on to some other area of life. Have you ever had a relationship with a dog, for example? For example? And I have to say yes or no. If I say no, it, and it goes up, right. Uh, yeah, if then it, you, then right. Then and you see I'm lying. I see you're lying, or you are supposed to take each one of these questions to what they call an FN a floating needle and you should be uh, you should have good indicators you should be smiling you should have some kind of a realization you would probably say oh, I feel so much better because if you have BI's or bad indicators that means that you've got a withhold if you've got a withhold that means you're a security risk For so, right so that means that we now have to keep an eye on you we have to put you under guard so anyone in, anyone in the RPF that I was responsible for, if we th found someone not just not completely happy about being in the RPF even, those people would be guarded. They were a security risk. If someone asked to leave, those people were guarded. And no one could leave. And how was this guarded? Uh, how, how, how? went this on. You take a guard, you take another RPF member, and you assign him, you guard him. Now, the whole it, day, all night? Or all day, all night, he would be under guard. Mm -hmm. Doing his work? Doing, doing his work, yes. And he's looking that he's not leaving the premises, for example? Right, right. And always controlling him? Right. Even if he goes to the toilet? If you go with him. You stand in front of the door and wait until he comes out? Yeah. And it's always a man to a man and a woman to a woman, or is it, it mixture? It, it sometimes could be either way. So it was often the case where a woman would be guarded by a man. Mm -hmm. And generally you would assign the, a bigger person, you would understand what the physical relationship was. Mm -hmm. If someone asked to leave, 
they were put under guard. That means asked to leave to, to leave the RPF. It, to it, go and work again on, on regular work. No, 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 no. Well, no one could do that. They would just that wouldn't be allowed. But if they were assigned to the RPF and they said, "I want out," meaning I want out of the sea organization, perhaps I want out of Scientology, they couldn't leave. They were put under guard, and they had to then go through a very special set of of sec check questions. Have you? What have you done to L. Ron Hubbard? What, do you have any critical thoughts about L. Ron Hubbard? Do you have any critical thought about Scientology? Who's have you ever question? stolen anything from the organization? Do you have any financial irregularities? It just goes on and on and on and on and on. It can go on for days. And before the person can leave, they would have to sign a list of all of their crimes which had been taken out of their auditing files, which would be held then for future blackmail. If the person ever spoke out, they would then say, hey, this guy's a criminal. Look at the list of crimes that he signed before a person could leave. And if he's not signing his... Uh, if his he refuses to sign, he can't leave. He can't leave. They don't let him out of the door. Exactly. They said to stay here until you sign. Yeah. And who is uh, telling him this? The twin? The other? RPF uh, uh, partner? Oh, no, his twin, he would no longer have a twin. His twin would be taken away from him, and, and he would in? just be assigned, he would then be guarded by the RPF. And if he became a bigger security threat than that, he would be handed over to, to the Guardian's office. Or to the um, Office of Special Affairs. Exactly. Now, no? That means the Secret Service. Yeah. That means you are in the RPF, in this prison system, and you want to go out, then somebody from outside, um, outside the RPF, coming in and asking these questions within the prison system. That, that, that easily could happen. We reported somebody regularly... From OSA, somebody from OSA? Or? We reported regularly to the Guardian's Office Intelligence Bureau, which had by, by then been set up in the Fort Harrison. Anyone who wanted to leave was a security threat. We reported them to the, to the Guardian's Office and his list of crimes would go to the Guardian's Office because it would be the Guardian's Office personnel who would later use this in the event that the person that the person went uh, went to the media or went to the government went to the police mm -hmm. now we we covered up what we were doing uh, in the RPF so the Guardian's Office the the local personnel would find out that there was going to be a, an inspection by the city authorities mm -hmm. so we had a routine where all of the beds would be taken stacked somewhere covered with sheets as if they were in storage and the the auditing area where where we were operating, all of that would be all closed up and it would just look like a storage area. In the Fort Harrison? In the Fort Harrison. Mm -hmm. And what was your own experience? You never uh, said that you wanted to leave the RPF or you accepted this bad treatment because you wanted to go on with the Sea Org or why you uh, went through the whole program for 17 months? I was so dedicated, so brainwashed, and so utterly dominated by the Scientology thought process that although I was devastated by it, by the being assigned to the RPF, and by the conditions, and by the humiliation, because you are treated truly as a, as a second-class citizen, you're a slave, in there. You have no rights whatsoever. You have no contact with the outside. But I accepted that because of my my devotion to the to the cause, my thinking, my accepting of the idea that it was the best thing for mankind if I were to undergo this punishment. Is there a possibility to, to phone to your parents out of the Is there a possibility to phone uh, to your parents out of the RPF, out of the prison camp, to say uh, what is happening there, or is there no way to give any messages to the outside world? Oh, all mail in mm -hmm. and all mail out was checked. And so if there was a problem with a parent, then the contact had to be made, telephone calls were monitored, mail was monitored, people were forced to write letters 
in order to take care of a problem which may exist with a parent. That means sometimes they are writing, you're writing to your parents before Christmas, I'm here and I'm fine, I'm f well doing, and yes. no problems. That means they are writing the lies down and they're giving to their brothers, sisters. Exactly. To cover the, the real condition. Right, you, you could never say that I'm here in the RPF and I can't talk to anyone, I have to run everywhere, I'm sleeping in the, in the garage, I'm not allowed to read newspapers, I'm not allowed to see TV, I'm not allowed to listen to radio, and I'm having to undergo this security checking all the time, and I'm having to write up my crimes, and I'm scared to death. If you wrote one word which didn't look, as Scientology says, good roads, fair weather, you're a security risk, you're under guard. In the prison? In the prison. That means more time in the prison, and it could happen, and if you would do that, that you have to go to the uh, worst condition, that means going to the RPF, RPF. Certainly. If you would do that, and if you would um, talk to your brother, or your sister, or your or your father, or your mother on the phone, oh. you would say, uh, I, please come and get me because I have a problem, then they would cut down the telephone at once or they put it down? Oh, oh, if, if they were monitoring yeah. a tele telephone yeah. call oh, like that yeah. oh, and, and you said, Mom, they're right here, yeah. uh, <coughs> instantly, means they would never permit something like that. They stop the telephone call at once and they break it. it that, to my knowledge, never happened. but there was someone there to listen to the call and monitor it in that eventuality so that that did not happen. And, and there, there were people who were able to make telephone calls and were, who were able to escape. There were a number of escapes from the RPF. And you can imagine people were planning this through time knowing that they're putting up with these conditions but they have that intent to get away one way or another. So people do escape. And what is happening uh, when the escape was, uh, uh, yeah, uncovered? Oh, if, if now, if the person escaped from a guard, now that guard is assigned a condition. The guard gets punished because he let the person escape. He was out security. And if he was not guarded, the twin was punished. The twin, the twin would be punished. The, the, per the, the person who was who was sec checking him would be punished, the MAA would be punished, and the bosun would be punished. If there was an escape, everyone got punished. In the whole RPF, in the whole it prison? Well, those people who had any responsibility for the person at all. And the pu punishment could be in worse condition. Yeah. That means uh, more, more work. More work. Less eating, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Worse food. Yeah, RPF's no RPF. Sleep. Yeah. And uh, that means you cannot speak to anybody else. Yep. You are alone for your. Yep. You have your own place, and can you have no outside contacts and inside contacts. Anymore. Right. And this can go more on. More humiliation, more degradation, more time. Mm -hmm. All because someone else wanted to escape the conditions. And did you heard or ever heard as somebody killed him or herself during the RPF? Mm, no. Or that something like this happened. Or try to kill himself? Uh, not that, not that I know of. Not in your time. In no, the no. But there were people who were, when we brought people into the RPF. Now Scientology likes to say that people go voluntarily, and that this is a a reward. They they claim that it's an opportunity that they provide for people who would, who have been messing up on post or may have done something wrong. It's an opportunity for them, rather than to ha have to leave Scientology, they give, give them this option, this spiritual rehabilitation option. That is a complete lie. I have taken people kicking and screaming to the RPF. There was one, one fellow who was a fairly good friend, took four people kicking and screaming, and he was bodily brought down to the RPF and bodily dominated until he was settled down, until he accepted 
his being in the in the prison. And how uh, your wife survived the RPF? Was she the same? She's as tough as I am. Same tough. Yeah. And do you had any uh, personal contacts during your time in the prison? Uh, could you sleep together in one room or in one bed? Uh, no. Is this allowed? No. I, and there came a time when RPF couples could have what they called one night a week if your stats were up. So if you were not a security risk and there was no, no problem and you were in a, a normal condition, and ag again that's an ethics condition or an ethics state in Scientology, then you would be lo allowed one night a week with your spouse. And you also were allowed, uh, your spouse could eat a meal with you, although if the spouse was, an, was a non-Scientol or a non-RPF member, they could eat meals together, but often schedules conflicted, so that often did not happen. And they were allowed some contact with their children, but that also uh, depended on whether or not their statistics were up, whether or not they were considered a security risk, and, w and whether or not the bosun or the MAA allowed them to do so. Are they putting children in the RPF? Uh, there were no children in the RPF when I was there. However, there are policies for a children's RPF. So there are circumstances when uh, children are are assigned. Now there were a very young chil there there were young girls. Uh, one in particular, Tanya Burden, who I guess was uh, 16 or 17 at the time. So she was she was a a teenager who was assigned to the RPF. But that's not what Scientology considers children, and so we did not have a children's RPF. Mm -hmm. That means for Hubbard children. That means for Hubbard children uh, are. Um, They're little adults. Little adults. Mm -hmm. Little thetans. Treated the same way. Yeah. And how often, uh, uh, when you are in the RPF, you can see your child, or can your child be within with you in the RPF? No. Then no, what you're if somebody has a five-year or six-year-old child, and you are assigned to the RPF. Who so. Well, the organization would take care care of the of the child in some way. They would assign a nanny. Uh, we did not have those exact circumstances at the time. However, there were RPF people who were assigned who had infants. So there, that's just because when they came ashore, they began to have have children, which were not permitted. It was not permitted to have children on board the ship. So there began to be children born to flag couples after, after we came ashore in Florida. And a limited amount, like at a meal time, sometimes you'd be able to eat a meal with your spouse or with your children. But, it, but you really were. I mean, it, it broke families up. That means the, the kids uh, like, would be like orphans. A lot, a lot like orphans. It, it's like it's like going to prison. So, a child, you know, man's assigned to uh, to prison for a period of time. There are visiting hours. Same was true in the RPF. Same. Right. But there are also times when the person would be in isolation or in prison, solitary. Do you have or do you have privacy within the RPF? Uh, that means your it's own. Extremely limited. You Did you, you really had. Uh, you can, but your time is so limited that that would be like at a meal time, something like that. But you could not read magazines. You could not read newspapers. Nothing. So there was no news or anything like that getting in. Radio. No, no radio. And no outside contact to no. the outside world of Scientology. Right. We are even not allowed to, to talk to Scientologies. You're not right. So they've created both a physical and psychological prison within 
society within the great United States of America, uh, land of the land of the free. And what kind of clothes did you wear? The official clothing during that time were black boiler suits. Now, often there weren't black boiler suits available, so we wore other dark clothing of some kind. But the the official dress was a black boiler suit. Even when it's very Even when it's outside. very hot. Yeah. You yeah. have to, you have to run everywhere trousers and in Florida. Mm -hmm. Okay, we change the... Uh, yeah. yeah. When... How did they wake up you in the morning? Is there somebody coming in, in the garage and asking, wake up, or how does it work? Right, we had and a... When, at what time? Uh, I, my recollection is that it was a set time, like 0700. So 7 a.m., that would be lights on, and then, you know, with, with seven hours sleep, lights, lights off. So it was, and it was extremely rigid. That time click went off. If it, for any reason, it was different, that would be a violation of some kind from the schedule. But we woke up because we had a guard posted around the clock. So. Okay. Uh, that means the whole RPF or was, guarded. was guarded. Yes. Always. Always. By another one, by somebody from. Right. Well, who you, guarded you, the you were, it wasn't possible to guard all the RPF units that would be working throughout the base because we did all the cleaning. We did the cleaning at the then the, the Clearwater Bank building, which was the administrative uh, building of, that ran Scientology. And then the Fort Harrison. So we did all the cleaning and we did that generally before the, the crew was up. So we would be up at, at 7 o'clock and then everyone would muster in the garage mm -hmm. and work, yeah. Good. Let me check. Buddies? Yeah. 
Okay. Ready? Yes. Who uh, about Xenu, the galactic overlord, the one responsible for combining us all with space aliens that had to be exorcised at the cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars in the new era operating Titan, the Knots. And one of the Knots is a violation of U.S. law. Cures for illness, Knots 34. Ah. Wait a minute, I want you to get the bag. Hold on. You got film? I'll wait. You can come back and get another one. Addressing a member of Scientology's office, special affairs probably, trying to get a picture of me as a former member of the office. gradient process in order to become a superhuman. So this is supposed to be the top place where you can come to achieve these kind of states. But there's not one person in this building, nor will there ever be, that can do that. Because L. Ron Hubbard himself couldn't do it. So it's like all kind of like a mind game. It's a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult mind game. And you know, you know, everyone has an ego to a greater or lesser degree. You know, if all of these people are sitting in here thinking they're going to become Superman, you know they got bad egos, mm -hmm. you know, and plus, and now, you know, the more of them you get together and then they all agree, well, I did something today, I had this thought and, you know, I saw this, so it kind of feeds itself. Right, right. And that's why they're here. Uh, 
Chief Klein, you are the police chief of Clearwater. Yes, Sid Klein, chief of police in the city of Clearwater. And we've had a very peaceful event so far this weekend, starting Friday night. Today is Saturday, and we have another event tomorrow, Sunday. We've deployed a number of officers today from the department in the event we would have trouble. We have not had any events, no arrests. Uh, both sides seem to be doing this very peacefully today, and we're hopeful it will conclude uh, in a very peaceful manner and uh, the citizens of Clearwater can go back to our normal lives. Is there any chance you could uh, turn your radio on? Yes. Okay. You should have told me that before. <laughs> but it was fine. Huh? Okay. Um, was there any, or is there any difference in your mind? It's a big difference since the things that happened last year ago. Um, Yes, there's a substantial difference between the events of this weekend so far and last year. As most everybody is aware, uh, last year the uh, Church of Scientology, uh, without any notice, decided to picket the Clearwater Police Department as well as the St. Petersburg Times building. Um, this year we have not had those kinds of problems. There have been many negotiations leading up to today. And at this point, in the uh, weekend, it appears that uh, they, they, the church, are living up to their part of the agreement. And what kinds of negotiations do you have? The negotiations would pertain to uh, which sidewalks would be open, uh, who was entitled to which kind of permits, as far as picketing and sound permits, and we were able to uh, work out most of those details to all party satisfaction we see right now is that they try to close down every walk that they can disturb the picket and uh, did you manage that this plan was open? That this was open or? This was a result of negotiations and as you can see the uh, church members have not interfered with the picketers today and that was uh, clearly agreed to uh, as we negotiated arrangements on both sides. Okay? Anybody asked me to shoot downtown Clearwater. Where would you shoot it from? I think I shot it from the boat when I was over there, maybe. It's not really.
left to right? To the left and right. Okay. Locations.
Edward Hubbard himself has done it. Is it right? In both occasions. In both occasions. Right. In the first and in the second. Yes. Uh, why on the second time? The second time, uh, I was assigned, along with uh, five other people, I believe. Uh, it, Hubbard considered that we were joking about uh, his movie making. Mm -hmm. uh, we were we were shooting movies at that time uh, with Hubbard in La Quinta, Where is this? Uh, Southern California in the desert, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we, si we set up, that's probably my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Nobody can go Okay. Um, <laughs> it, it was a time, actually, Hubbard was sick. And so he was not going to be shooting that day. And instead of shooting, everyone was to drill on their respective jobs, their respective posts. What does that mean? Um, do training, training routines, uh, practice. Mm -hmm. Practice. So the cameraman was practicing camera work, mm -hmm. and um, you know, sound guys were practicing their sound, sound stuff. And um, and I happened to have a services job at that time. I was in charge of, you know, sort of back back lines, back channel, kind of service stuff. So I got to uh, do some acting that day. You know, I really had just a, a good time, you know, just drilling, doing doing things, some impromptu kind of stuff. And what kind of uh, movie was that? What you shoot there? Oh, uh, we were what shooting uh, training movies. He called them training movies. So they were some of them were promotional, so stuff that was going to be shown to bring people into Scientology, and some of them uh, had to do with aspects of Scientology, like the tone scale, like um, how the e-meter worked, and uh, internal material for their own stuff. To show yeah, how it works. exactly. Training movies. So uh, we were supposed to, at the end of this day, send up a, a demonstration uh, shot to Hubbard, and so one of the lighting guys got chosen to set up and set down a big spotlight. And this was to show how competent he, they had become in their in their one day of training, and it's you know it's a kind of a humorous idea, just to begin with, but he felt that we made a complete mockery of it, and I w I did it you know an, an announcer, off off screen, and I announced it like a Barnum and Bailey ring announcer, ladies and gentlemen, and this you know this lighting guy was leaping around, setting up and setting, setting down the light. And, you know, the cameraman shot it and the lighting guy lit it and the, the uh, producer produced it. So it goes up to Hubbard and he, he came unglued and signed us all to the RPF because he felt that we were joking. The whole team. Yeah, joking is considered a completely taboo. You're not allowed to joke. Mm -hmm. And so I spent the next month, month in the, or the next eight months in the RPF, and that was it at La Quinta. And that time, it was uh, it was located in a, a property that they bought, which was a, a date farm. So part of the RPF duties at that time were to irrigate and take care of the of the dates, but also we did all the other routines that you did in the RPF, and all of went through the same program that I'd gone through before in order to do the things you had to do to get out of the RPF. Same conditions apply. R ran everywhere, wear a black boiler suit, can't talk to anyone. And that la that went on for another eight months. In La Quinta. Right. La Quinta, part of the time, and then the cover for the property was blown in La Quinta. In La Quinta, we again could not um, openly be Scientology. Everyone there had to, our cover was that we were friends of Norton Carno. Norton Carno was Hubbard's tax attorney. In fact, he was a tax attorney involved with uh, financial matters for the organization and Hubbard and had been that for, for some years. And uh, I, I believe to this day continues to have some kind of a relationship like that. 
in any case, the cover was blown. Two people who had been uh, really uh, treated, uh, held uh, in, in La Quinta had blown, which means to leave anyone who, who leaves without uh, properly routing out, had, they blew or left in any case and went to the media to tell the media about what was going on at La Quinta, that it was all Scientology, that Hubbard was there, and that we were shooting movies, etc., etc. So when that happened, now it was no longer secure for Hubbard to be there, so he left, and we, the RPF, also left, and at that time, they purchased another property, uh, which was at Gilman Hot Springs, which I'm sure you've, you've encountered, you've been out there. So the RPF then moved to Gilman, and they had the job of renovating uh, Hubbard's house where he was intending to to live. And uh, I did that until, I guess, April or May of um, 1979, and then I again got out of the RPF. So that, that was the end of my RPF career, a total of 25 months. How was your... Yeah, give me one second. Is that stomach rumbling going to come no. through? <laughs> no. <laughs> God. Okay. Whenever you say. And how was the um, how was the living condition in the RPF at Gilman Hot Springs, at the New World headquarters of Scientology, for Hubbard? It it was really much the much the same as it had been. This is a much smaller RPF, and of course the security level was much higher, as as well because this was another secret base. At that time, we were pretending to be the Scottish Highland Quietude Club, and there was only a few people at the property to begin with, and then, of course, it grew into, uh, within a few months, there was 100, 150 people there. The RPF unit was, I would say, 25 people altogether. 25 prisoners? Yeah. All together? In our little gulag in the desert. Mm -hmm. And where did you sleep? Uh, at that time, we lived in, there are some, what they call the cabins, which are below Highway 79 and uh, out toward the east end of the property. And how many people in one room? I believe all the RPF at that time was, was in one of those uh, cabin complexes. So there were a lot of people. In one all. Room? Well, not not one room. We had we had women and and uh, men in the RPF, so, so they, they they were separated. Separated. Yeah. And it was um, prison business as usual, like in Clearwater. Yeah. Means all the rules were the same. Penalties were the same. The RPF remained basically unchanged. Mm -hmm. And no contact to the outworld. No. And, and the same thing, we also had escapes from the RPF. At that time? Yeah. How did that happen? Or who? Well, in fact, there was a, there was a, a couple who escaped, Bill and Debbie Fosdick. They, they were not married at that time, but they, they escaped together and ultimately got married. And I got the job of going to retrieve them. To get them back? Mm hmm And how, yeah, how was your job to do that? Uh, indeed, I did. I did go to uh, where they were living in up in the mountains in California, and uh, got them back. But this was after you have been out of the RPF. I I think so. I I'm not I'm not sure if it was around that time, but um, for whatever reason, I was entrusted to to go do it. And it was the same guarded thing, fences and around. There was no way to, to leave that RPF? Uh, well, there, there was always a way to leave, and we did, have, we did have people leave. It was not fenced in like it is fenced in now. That's much higher security that they have, have there now. But how, the, uh, but how was the security at that time, that they don't leave? Well, the people, people are held, really, it's a, it's a psychological hold as much as a, as a physical hold on these people. 
but when it's viewed that the psychological hold might not work, then they're physically held. So we had people in the same state, people who wanted to leave, people who were viewed as security risks and might leave, and those people were guarded and not permitted to leave. Who decided that? Oh, uh, it would be, uh, I was the MAA during most of my time in that uh, RPF. So what was your function? At, at my function, in part, was to make sure that nobody left. Mm -hmm. to make sure that nobody was a flap, to make sure that there was no out security. And how did you manage that to do? By, by keeping very tight control on everyone and making sure that if anyone gave the slightest indication of being in doubt about what we were doing or questioning what we were doing or, or being, as they say, having bad indicators, so didn't look happy about what was going on, those people would be separated out and uh, guarded, not permitted to leave. And we had the same routine. If someone did want to leave, he was security checked. And, uh, what does that mean? That, Question and answer? Right. That kind of, a, of a, a metered interrogation looking for crimes, looking for things that can be used later against you. With the lie detector. Yeah. Things which are embarrassing from your life, things for which you can be blackmailed, crimes, and then lists of these incidents are typed up or written up. person has to sign before they can leave. And how was the organization, who organized the RPF? Under which uh, department within the organization was that? Is there a director? Well... That means an organizational director or...? When we were in, in Clearwater, the RPF organizationally was considered uh, in the estates unit. So the head of the estates department uh, was really organizationally the RPF senior. However, the RPF was such a big, powerful unit and got used for all sorts of things, so it actually Oh, and because it was so sensitive and used for punishment of often very top people, it came organizationally directly under the CMO, the Commodore's Messenger Organization. Those are, for most part, the young kids who had been working with Hubbard and served him personally and carried out his orders, relayed his orders and enforced his orders. So the RPF reported actually directly to the CMO. Out at La Quinta, because the RPF was working on Hubbard's house, renovating his house, for the most part, our organizational seniors were Hubbard's household unit. So the commanding officer of the household unit was the person to whom we mainly reported. Mm -hmm. But the RPF organizationally was below everyone, so anyone outside the RPF really was, was um, had authority over the RPF. But organizationally, the command line, for the most part, ran from the RPF to the CMO or the RPF to the household unit. How would you um, describe uh, what an RPF is to, to somebody who has no idea? Outside of Scientology, how would you describe that kind of thing? In your words, what you, uh, what they have done to you. That means, um, what we say, it is the RPF. It's a prison camp, or yeah, what is it? It's a, it's a camp. It's a, it's a gulag. It's a. A, it's a it's a prison but it's a it's a prison which is within it it doesn't necessarily have walls it's not separated off from the rest of the world and the rest of the people so it is able to travel into the rest of 
the Scientology society but lives by different rules and is subject to a, a different set of of punishment so it's it's both a psychological and a physical prison within society it's a gulag on American soil okay we'll make a short stop in that there Here we go. Mm -hmm. oh. So in your and did you felt that when you have been in that gulag and that prison camp? Did you oh, I knew that that's what it was, but I accepted that be up to a certain point. I mean, I I maintained my my sent my humanity to to the degree that it was possible in there. So I wasn't overly cruel when the opportunity arose. So I, I was a humane uh, prison warden and prisoner myself. But I, I knew that, that, that that's what it was. I knew that I was being punished. But you never questioned it. I accepted it. I accepted. I accepted the punishment. And same your wife. Yeah, she went through it too. Uh huh. Twice, same as I did. Same time. Yeah, same time on both occasions. Same places. Mm hmm. And uh, what was the reaction of Hubbard when you came back out of the prison? He was the same, like 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 always to you, or he changed his his habit to you, or his. Is dealing with you? No, he he was basically basically the same. I mean, I I suppose by virtue of the fact that I submitted to the punishment of the RPF and submitted to that kind of domination, I was even more acceptable to him. It appeared like like he could do whatever he wanted with me, and I I would take it without complaint. So ultimately, and ironically, because of that, because of the abuse I took from him for so many years, I was able to do the research for his biography. I was trusted with his personal archive after he had twice RPF'd me. Because you made it. Because I made it. And, and because I had possession of his personal archive, I was able to deprogram myself of Scientology and disabuse myself of the implant that Hubbard had, had created in me. And how did this uh, work out? He gave you the material and say, Jerry, do my biography, or how did it work? It was a, a set of, of coincidences. I, was, I had been out of the RPF for eight months. So this was right at the beginning of January 1980, and there was a, a threat of, of a raid. Sci a Scientology, the Scientology intelligence bureaus had been raided by the FBI in 1977, and there were continual announcements that maybe there would be another raid and maybe there would be a raid at Gilman Hot Springs. Well, the beginning of 1980, there was an announcement that a raid was imminent and we were required to destroy all evidence that Hubbard intended to live at the property of his control of Scientology, of his ordering virtually anything. And in the process of destroying all that evidence, one of my juniors at that time who was in charge of Hubbard's personal effects, which were stored on the property in, a, in an old hotel, she came to me and she said, I found this box of very old papers. And I looked at it and thought, wow, these are extremely valuable. They're val it was old correspondence between him and his family. It was uh, correspondence and documents which predated even his birth between his his grandparents involving his father and it was a material which 
predated for the most part even even his writing of the Dianetics book in 1950. So I knew that these had these did not fit within the criteria of documents which we were destroying. So I said, no, don't destroy those. And I took them from her and went through them and then made a search of his personal effects and uncovered some 20 more boxes. And based on that, I petitioned Hubbard to be able to assemble these things, which he wrote back and indicated that he had believed that these had been lost or stolen years ago. So now with these things in my possession, I knew that they would be the basis for a library, they'd be the basis for a biography. And so uh, he, he granted my, my petition. You and talked to him? Or no, I, I wrote to him and I petitioned him. It, such things were possible. You could write a petition to, to Hubbard to do something and like that. And this, this, yeah, he, he approved it. Okay. And this was an extraordinary set of circumstances mm -hmm. where it appeared as if his long lost archive had been discovered when a search was made of his personal effects. These were boxes of material and, and his personal effects which had followed him from England to Washington DC to um, Southern California and ended up in this old hotel at, at um, Gilman Hot Springs. So I had possession of, of these personal papers for the next two years. And what did you do with them? Well, I, assemb I assembled them, I organized them, I copied them, and we did, we contracted with a non-Scientologist writer by the name of Omar Garrison. And I provided copies of these materials to Garrison over the next many months. And in doing so, I studied the materials myself and Garrison being a non-Scientologist, it became more or less safe for me to communicate with him because he was not going to report to anyone. And it was because I was able to travel a little bit outside the perimeter of Scientology. And in the process of doing the biography research, I traveled around the Pacific Northwest and, and into the Midwest, interviewing his remaining family members and doing, doing a genealogy study and gathering more documents. And what did you find out after that? Well, after for reviewing and after checking the documents, the dates, everything? Uh, well, for me, what was significant was that it showed that virtually all of the, the statements, the representations which Hubbard had made about himself There are two biographies, the official biography by Scientology in Hubbard himself and the real biography. Right. And what did you find out? Well, things that were significant to me, his, his statement that he was a nuclear physicist, that he was a civil engineer, that he was a, a, a war hero had, who had received 21 medals and palms, that he was crippled and blinded and had and had cured himself with Dianetics, that he was twice pronounced dead. Things like that about himself and things about, it, about his family. He wasn't, he wasn't a war hero. He would got in difficulty throughout, throughout the whole war. He'd received four standard service medals during the war that anyone else in the service got. He wasn't crippled. He wasn't blinded. He wasn't a civil engineer. He wasn't a nuclear physicist. He flunked down to his second year of college. And this was the guy that I had devoted my life to. And when that started to come apart, and I knew that Hubbard had defrauded me with representations about his personal life, then the whole package of Scientology started to come apart. And I knew that rather than Scientology being the answer, and healing people and giving them greater abilities and making them better humans it was completely abusive and and had no other purpose than to dominate and control people and make buckets of money and so when this happened and I knew that that was the real biography 
that was the truth. Then I made plans relatively quickly. Oh, I tried throughout several months in 1981 to try to get the organization to strip the literature of all of these lies and to tell the truth about the guy. But I ran into tremendous opposition and when I tried to do that, finally, I was then ordered to be sec checked. I was sent back from Los Angeles to Gilman Hot Springs to be sec checked. But I was very fortunate to be able to avoid that and that's when I made plans that I was going to get out of the organization. So bit by bit, I moved my stuff off the property and then escaped. Did in, your wife? Yeah, December 1981. And did you ever have a chance to talk about this discrepancy with Hubbard himself? Uh, no. I, I never saw Hubbard after 1979. A few times he arrived at the Gilman Hot Springs in uh, the back of a blacked out van and he would come to the house and, and sometimes he would he would shoot some some still shots in a in a small uh, studio which they had uh, created but uh, that w and then coincidentally right around the time that he granted my petition and I took possession of his archive and began to do the research for his biography he dropped right out of sight again he went into hiding again because he was afraid of being served in the IRS case which was then going on and in some of the civil litigation which had begun. One of the messengers who was in the, the RPF with me by the name of Tanya Burden, she had escaped from the Fort Harrison and um, had filed a lawsuit. And there were other lawsuits. The Lawrence Wallersheim case had started. So because of these things, he really went into hiding and there was no further communication with him from me until I after I left. After I left, then the organization came after me. I knew immediately that I was on their, their hit list. They hi hired private investigators who harassed me for months in 1982. They staked out my, my home. One of the, those guys assaulted me. One ran into me and one tried to mess around with me on the freeway. And um, they, they've set me up in intelligence operations, stole a manuscript from me, sued me five times. Tried to destroy and you. It goes on and on and on. Yeah, they've, they have filed and published lies about me ever since, pursuant to their, their policy of fair game. In their minds, it is completely acceptable and laudable to cheat, steal from, lie to, lie about, hurt, or destroy someone who they consider is an enemy, someone who they label fair game. Um, I saw some pictures uh, from the wedding with your wife on the ship Apollo. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about a bit, a bit about that happening, about that day and where it was and how the situation was? I think it was December 10, 1974 and we were in Freeport in the Bahamas and I married uh, Terry. That was Hubbard's uh, top messenger. She was the commanding officer of the CMO. She was a, she was a babe. Just a great catch. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that kind of um, marital marital bliss that doesn't last too long in the sea organization and uh, you know we we were both RPF together twice and ultimately she was ordered to break up with me to divorce me after you left Scientology no 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 inside inside Scientology mm -hmm. this was at the time of of um uh, my second RPF assignment. The day that I got out of the RPF that second time, she told me that that she had been ordered that either she gets rid of me or she can't be back in the CMO. And so she chose to 
go back in the CMO, work for Hubbard, and that meant that she had to dump me. And so you lost her? Lost her. Through Scientology? Yeah. And it was a hard hit for you, I think. Huh? Yeah, it was, it was very cruel. It was very rotten. And you never been together with her since then? then? No. I, uh, she testified at my trial in 1984. She testified for Scientology. Against you? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that she's now out of Scientology. And uh, who knows, she may be testifying on my side one day. Mm. But since then you never talked to her? No. No contact? No. And she never tried to contact you? No. And you have no way to contact her? Oh, I think I, I could. I have not, not bothered her. I'm, you know, I, a lot of heat comes with contact with me. Mm. Uh, one more thing. Uh, this party, this wedding, it is on the ship. Yeah. And how this went on, I see Hubbard in the middle, and uh -huh. on the right on the left side, I see young boys, and young women, and in the back, uh, also a lot of nice, beautiful women. Yeah, those, uh, those were the messengers. You see, there were two messengers getting married, and Hubbard gave away the brides. His see, brides. his well, he he gave them away to the, we were to the two grooms. You'll see P Pat Broker, who later on on the one side is Pat Broker, and he was marrying Trudy. And on the other side, you'll see me, and I'm marrying Terry. And Hubbard, you know, the, he was the father figure. He gave away the brides. So um, you probably have the same concept in Germany, right? The, the father goes down the aisle with the with the, the bride to hand her over to the groom. And this and was so this, what Hubbard did. Right, so this is what happened on that occasion. And then that picture is we're sitting down, I think, yeah, it, we're sitting down after the wedding, and it's a you know something of a party. It was a Scientology wedding. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or is this a real valid wedding, in in a non-Scientology sense? Or well, it really, really no. It it, it was not, and we didn't treat it that way. This was a, a sort of a a Sea Org ceremony. We had already gotten married in a civil ceremony uh, in the Bahamas. In a legal way. A legal way, and right. It was a second, a second uh, right. to make it for Scientology legal. Yeah. yeah. Now, it, it, it's true. I, I have no reason to doubt that Scientologists can legally perform marriages. But as far as I'm concerned, Scientology is not a religion. I was given my a minister's certificate for the very purpose of making me a minister so that I could get a green card to be in the United States. I but I, would, I never considered myself a minister and never considered Scientology a religion. And are they doing the same things today that other people getting green cards here, Scientologists to work here? I have no reason to doubt that. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's their pattern. It's a trick. Yeah, the continual, continual. They're tricksters, they're liars, cheats, and tricksters. And what what did you felt? Uh, what did you felt when when you heard that Hubbard died? You have been when you read that. In the well, um, I think that it was the the same day that the Challenger space craft uh, blew up, I recall. And I recall being moved by that and not moved by Hubbard's death. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we're finished. Okay. Thank you very much. So we go back. Wow. The same day the Challenger blew up, Hubbard died. <laughs>